If you have your Bible today, I'd encourage you to turn. We have two passages of Scripture that we are going to look at today. The first is in the Gospel of Mark, the sixth chapter, and reading there verses 1 through 13, and then an Old Testament reading from the book of Ezekiel, and the second chapter and reading there verses 1 through 5. We will look at Mark's Gospel passage first, Mark chapter 6, and beginning with verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Let's turn back to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2 and reading there verses 1 through 5. Ezekiel chapter 2, and beginning our reading with verse 1. He said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. So did anyone see any fireworks this week? Sure. We, in our nation's history, uh, celebrate our Independence Day. And often our towns and communities and so on celebrate by having concerts and sending off fireworks and all kinds of things. I enjoyed all of mine from the comfort of my recliner. Uh, Chambersburg didn't have theirs on Wednesday evening because of weather, and we plum forgot about it last night. We could have gone, but uh, the my, my memory is the first thing to go, and I can't remember what the second thing is. <laughs> On this date, July 8th, 122 years ago, a man stood and delivered a speech that is quite well remembered by many people in our nation. It was entitled, The Cross of Gold Speech. It was delivered in a political format by a man who was a staunch conservative <coughs> challenging our nation to consider changing what it is we were doing. The man's name is William Jennings Bryan. He was at the Democratic National Convention which was being held in Chicago, Illinois 
And because of that cross of gold speech, on the third ballot, he became the chosen candidate and ran for the presidency of the United States. As you know, he was not elected. He ran again in 1900, utilizing the same theme, the same theme that had carried him to that before. Then again in 1908, he ran again unsuccessfully. The first time in 1896, he carried the popular votes, but he did not carry the vote of the Electoral College. He later then served as Secretary of State under the Woodrow Wilson administration and concluded his career as being the prosecuting attorney in the Scopes Monkey Trial held in Cleveland, Tennessee in 1926. A few weeks after the trial was over, and he was successful, by the way, in defending the political position of the church, that creation is the way that God has introduced mankind. It is not through evolution. A few weeks later, he died. Hard to think of him in some respects as being a rebel. But he was. The issue that he spoke about in 1896 is the issue of gold. And I'll make this real simple for you. At that time, all of our monetary system was based on gold. For every paper, $1 bill, $5 bill, $10 bill, or whatever, that was printed, there needed to be $1 or 5 or 10 or whatever of gold kept in reserve. You could go to any bank and trade your $5 bill for $5 worth of gold. What's the problem with that, you might say? Money becomes scarce. There's only so much gold that is on reserve, and there was only so much money that could be printed. And it oppressed business. It oppressed <coughs> development greatly. Bryan was advocating a change to the silver standard. And later it did, almost at the end of his life. It did finally happen in about 1921, if I remember correctly when we changed from the gold standard to the silver standard. And some of you are old enough to remember on a dollar bill or a five dollar bill at the top, instead of saying a Federal Reserve note, it would say a silver certificate. And so for a long time, our nation had one dollar of silver in a reservoir, a bank, a vault, for every one dollar bill that was printed. Today, our money says a Federal Reserve note. In God we trust. Our money, in some respects, isn't worth the paper that it's printed on. But I would suggest to you it's far more valuable today than it has ever been because it helps us to rely and to know about strength and faith and belief. So today we don't have a gold standard or a silver standard. We have a faith standard. Our nation is a nation of rebels. That's what happened when and Boston, Massachusetts, they went out onto the ship and broke open those boxes of tea and dumped them into the harbor. That's happened. That's what happened when the first shots took place at Lexington and Concord. We're a nation of rebels. And I want you to understand that it's a good thing to be a rebel at times. It depends upon what we are rebelling against. Now poor Ezekiel gets called by the Lord to go and be a prophet to the nation of Israel. And God says to him, here's your congregation. They're obstinate and stubborn. Hoo hoo, Charlie. <laughs> Don't you just want to serve that group of people? 
obstinate and stubborn. They have rebelled against God. And you speak to them. Whether they listen to you or don't listen to you doesn't matter. Because they're stubborn and obstinate. But you speak to them the word I give you and they will know that a prophet has stood among them. Last Sunday, I challenged you. with a national call to repentance and faith. While indeed it is true that we have never been a Christian nation, we have been a nation that has been filled with Christians. We have no former formal theology as a part of our mandate as a nation. We don't advocate one brand of Christianity as opposed to another. We don't advocate Christianity as opposed to Judaism. We have been free in our practice of religion. But I would suggest to you that the great majority of our nation's founders were Christian. Today, we are losing our grip. In fact, some would say we have lost our grip on Christianity in America. Today, the theologians write about a post-Christian America. I don't even like to think about that terminology. A post-Christian America? I hope not. I pray not. I insist not. I think that we, the church, have fallen into a time where it has been easier to listen than it is to participate. I remember asking a teenage boy, he was about 18 or 19 years of age, when I asked him this question. He played baseball and was a very good baseball player. I asked him, I said, Tim, would you like to go with me to see a professional baseball game someday? And he said, no. Really? You don't want to go see a baseball game? Why not? He said, I'd sooner play than watch. When you get to my age, you'd sooner watch them play. And I'm afraid that's what's happened in the church. We'd sooner watch than play. We'd sooner sit and listen than participate. I am so proud of the number of people who stood up here in the front of the congregation this morning, and I didn't count them, and I wish I would have. I'm so proud of this number of people who are willing to say yes, yes, yes. I'll help with vacation Bibles. There is no more important thing that you and I can do than to share Jesus with the next generation and with the existing generation. But I do understand that many things have changed in our nation. When Williams Jennings Bryan delivered the Cross of Gold speech, he was very passionate. He must have been a great orator. They estimated the crowd that day to be in excess of 10,000 people. He did not use a megaphone, and there weren't such thing as microphones. And everybody could hear him. He used in his speech, and in all of his political speeches, he had been, by the way, senator from the state of Nebraska. Born in Quincy, Illinois, 
but moved to Nebraska at a young age and entered into politics after he had finished college and law school. A very, very conservative Christian man who used in all of his political speeches stories of scripture to make his point. He believed in what he believed and he advocated for belief in what he believed. Now in that day in 1896 and through 1908 and into the 1920s and maybe even beyond, any politician could safely use a common Bible story as a point of reference, understanding that the audience would know what the story of Moses <coughs> might be, or what the story of Noah and the ark might be, or what the story of Jonah and the great fish might be. Unfortunately, today, we no longer have biblical literacy in our society. We don't have people who know what the story of Moses is, or the story of Noah, or the story of Jonah. These are unknown people to much of our society today. Why is that? It's because we as the church have chosen to sit and listen rather than to participate. We are no longer a nation of rebels in the same way that we were a nation of rebels in 1776 and beyond. We are a nation of tired people. Or at least seemingly we're tired. That's why I sat in my recliner and watched the fireworks. Instead of going to the city of Harrisburg or down to Washington, D.C. to see them on the National Mall or to go to New York City and watch them there or to Boston and hear that being done with the Boston Pops playing in the background. It's easier for us to sit than to participate. The beginning of the television age has overwhelmed us. Television is a wonderful tool, but it is not the panacea for all of the ills of our nation. But my generation and later have been raised with television. We take our children when they are, we're getting ready to go somewhere and we turn on, we get them dressed and ready and we set them down in the chair and turn on the TV to entertain them while we are getting dressed. We don't interact with our children so much as what we change the channel for them. Or better yet, they tell us how to fix our own TV. A number of years ago, quite a number of years ago, I went to one of the big box stores because I thought I needed a surround sound system for my TV to enhance the quality of my viewing and listening pleasure. And so I walk into this big box store and I'm not very technologically oriented about some things and so I go back to where the TVs are and the surround sound systems and, and a young man probably still in his teenage years, comes and says, can I help you? And I said, you sure can. He said, what can I do for you? I said, I'm interested in a surround sound system for my TV. He said, what kind of TV do you have? To which I answered, color. <laughs> 
And he looked at me just for a moment and I said, you don't even understand that comment, do you? And he said, no, I don't. I said, in my age, that was an option. Whether you had black and white or... He said, really? They had black and white TVs? <laughs> we have become pedestrian instead of militant. Occasionally, I need to attend the funeral of a pastor when one of our pastors or one of my pastoral friends dies. And invariably, the statement will be made, Pastor so-and-so has left the church militant to join the church triumphant. That's a wonderful statement. But are we? Militant? I'm not advocating the Crusades all over again. We learned about that in Sunday school this morning. It wasn't good and it really wasn't successful. But I am advocating that we live our Christianity. In simple and small ways. We don't have to go and knock on everyone's door and stand there with the four spiritual laws and wait to win that person to Jesus. That's probably not going to be very fruitful for us to do that today. Instead, maybe we need to take a loaf of bread over to our neighbor when they move in and welcome them. With a little brochure about the church maybe stuck in there. Something simple and easy to do. Maybe we need to go to our neighbor and say, hey, our church is having vacation Bible school this week and I'm going to be heading over there. If, if you'd like, why don't you come along and bring your children? We go from age 3 to 12. <coughs> We'd love to have your kids come and be a part of it. We'd love for you to come and be a part of it also. It's not hard. It's pretty easy. Jesus goes back to his hometown. Now it doesn't mean Bethlehem. It means Nazareth. Where he's been raised most of his life. And he goes back there and... and people begin to wonder about him. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Aren't his brothers, Joseph and, and, and Judah, and, and I forget the other one, and aren't these his sisters? They didn't believe. How could they miss it? Jesus is preaching the gospel. He is healing people. He is performing miracles. All of the evidentiary statements are there about who Jesus is. And they missed it. And Jesus says a prophet is not honored in his own country. And so he sends his disciples out. In groups of two. He gives them authority to cast out demons, to heal people, and to preach the good news. And he says, if you get to a town and no one wants to listen to you, dust off your feet and continue on. If someone doesn't really want to listen, you're wasting your time. Go on to someone who will. Instead today, for most of us, we'd sooner say, well the church is here at 101 East Lisburn Road and if someone wants to come, we'll welcome them. But ask me to go out and invite somebody? Well, what would they think? What would happen then? They'll think I'm a religious nut.
there is a risk in being a rebel. Of all 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, all of them had a death sentence on their head. Many of them were tortured and died. Many of them became bankrupt in the process. None of them had an easy time of it. I mentioned to you last week George Washington, who at age 40 stood on the banks of the Potomac River and dedicated himself to the Lord and said, whatever it is that you want me to do, I'll do. And what the Lord wanted him to do was to lead this nation. And he did. While he was the general of the army, during the American Revolutionary War, he had two horses shot out from underneath him. He discovered two bullet holes in his hat and four in his coat. He risked his life to lead our nation. In all probability, someone has shared Jesus Christ with you and told you about what it means to be a Christian. It may have been your mother or dad. It may have been a Sunday school teacher. It may have been a vacation Bible school teacher. It may have been your neighbor. But here's what I want you to realize. Whoever shared Jesus with you put their life at risk to do that. Not that you were going to shoot them. You were just going to disassociate yourself with them. They've just distanced themselves from you. I've been in the ministry for a very, very long time. And every once in a while I get invited to go somewhere where people don't necessarily know that I'm a pastor. It's at a party or something of the sort. And you're mingling and you're chatting with people and having fun and fellowshipping and all of those kinds of things. And invariably, sooner or later, someone will ask, well, what do you do for a living? I always tell them, I pastor a church. And I get one of two reactions. One is, the people will begin telling me about their church. The other is, oh, I need to refill my drink. Or get some more food for on my plate. And they never come back to the conversation again. Being a Christian is disruptive. And it ought to be because it changes us from death to life. I'm thrilled to watch however many children we have come here tonight, to see them sit in these front pews here and some, learn some new songs. And tonight they won't know what they're singing for the most part. But come Wednesday or Thursday, they'll be singing with gusto. It's changed them. And Christ ought to change us. Always. We need to rebel. Not against God. But against our own selves. And the standards that we have adopted. Being laissez-faire. Just letting what will be will be. We need to be active in sharing our faith. Not necessarily pounding every neighbor's door, plastering the four spiritual laws on their front of their doors so when they open they're confronted. 
that maybe isn't the best strategy today. But by emulating Jesus. This morning in Sunday school, I shared a story. One of the churches that I served had stained glass windows, and each of these stained glass windows in that particular church represented one of the, what we would call apostles. And in the sanctuary, there was a very large picture, stained glass picture, or stained glass window of Jesus walking and carrying the sheep in his arms. And then beside him were the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so I'm taking a group of children through there one day and explaining why, what these windows represent because they're depicted as uh, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. So at the conclusion of my little tour with the children, I said, what is a saint? And one of the children answered, the best answer ever. Someone who the light shines through. You are saints. And the light of Jesus needs to shine through you so that others who live in darkness can see Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day that the light of the world always overcomes the darkness. There's never an exception to that rule. We're thankful that Jesus has come to vanquish the darkness and to give us the light of day. We see darkness all around us, in our society and in our world. Help us to be light so that others might see Jesus. In Jesus we pray. Amen.